Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of being your moderator this evening as we take a tour through Spain's vibrant region of Andalusia, along with Rick and a very special guest. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to one of our tour guides for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us for this exciting Monday Night Travel Ed episode. We're going to Andalusia in Southern Spain, and we've got a special guest. You know, every Monday we get together, it's just been a delightful way for me to keep my enthusiasm for travel stoked because we get together once a week and we just get to celebrate all the places we love. So thank you for joining us. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you've got your best travel partner and a nice culturally uh, appropriate drink and some munchies. I'm having a vermouth here. And um, this vermouth, you can get a, a vermouth in uh, red, which is sweeter or white, which is drier. And uh, a vermouth. Yeah, you know, when I grew up, vermouth was sort of what a cheap drink that older people drank. Uh, but it's quite trendy now in Europe and we have vermouth bars. And I was in Barcelona, which is not in Andalusia, but it's in Spain. And the vermouth bars were just the rage. And you'll find casks of vermouth in, in tavernas all over Spain. We'll see them in the video clips we're going to show you in a moment here. But uh, vermouth bar is sort of a way you can drop in and connect with the culture. And uh, a vermouth is a, it's wine that is fortified with brandy or with port. And then it's spiced up with some herbs and some cinnamon and so on. And you put a little lemon in it and... Uh, it's just quite nice. And when you have your vermouth, you've also got some munchies. And I'm going to show you my food right here in a minute. But what I want to do is thank you for joining us. We are in the south of Spain. And I'm going to bring on our friend Concepcion in just a moment. But I want to take you to the Spring Fair. Because the Spring Fair is something that feels unique to Andalusia for me. And it's a celebration of life. I've been to many of them. And we're going to go to one in Sevilla right now. By the way, the Spring Fair for this coming year is the first week in May, the April. It's called the, the Spring or the April Fair. And it's the first week in May in 2022. But check this out. And then as you look at this, you'll know why so many of us love so much traveling in the spring in Andalusia. Here we go. As if to continue this celebration of the return of spring, some places let loose in vibrant secular festivals. One of the most exuberant and colorful is in Spain, Sevilla's gigantic spring fair. Throughout southern Spain, a region so expert at fiestas and romance, cities like Sevilla greet each spring with a festival for all ages. A festival where the horses are nearly as dressed up as the people, a springtime flirtatiousness fills the air, and travelers are more than welcome to join in the fun. For seven days each April, it seems much of Sevilla is packed into its vast fairgrounds. The fair feels friendly, spontaneous, very real. The Andalusian passion for horses, flamenco, and sherry is clear. Riders are ramrod straight. Colorfully clad senoritas ride side saddle and everyone's drinking sherry spritzers. Women sport outlandish dresses that would look clownish all alone, but somehow brilliant here en masse. Hundreds of private party tents, or casetas, line the lanes. Each striped tent is the party zone of a particular family, club, or association. To get in, you need to know someone in the group or make friends quickly. My local friend, Concepcion, is well-connected. And as a friend of a friend, we're in. This is your caseta? Because of the exclusivity, it has a real family affair feeling. Throughout Andalusia, at spring fairs like Sevilla's, it seems everyone knows everyone in what seems like a thousand wedding parties being celebrated all at the same time. Wow. A thousand wedding parties all being celebrated at the same time. It really does feel that way. And you can crash the party. That's the great thing. I went there with uh, Concepcion and we just had a wonderful time filming. I think I've connected with Concepcion every summer or every spring for the last 15 or 20 years when I'm in Spain. And I mentioned the spring because it's awfully hot in the summer. And if you can go in the spring or the fall, that behooves you, that's for sure. But um, I'm really thankful for all the help um, Concepcion has given me for researching in Sevilla for our guidebooks, for our TV shows, and for our tours. 
And Concepcion is spending the middle of her night in Spain with us today. It's four o'clock in the morning, and I'd like to welcome Concepcion Delgado. Concepcion. Should Hi, we good say, night. Do we say buenos dias or buenas noches right now? I'm, I'm not so sure. I would say <laughs> buenas noches still. Still buenas noches. Thank you. How are you doing, Concepcion? Very well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And when you look at that uh, spring fair, you must think of, when I went there, I thought families, I thought tradition, I thought many generations. It's, it's, I even thought small town. There's something very cozy and convivial about that spring fair. What, what does it mean to you as just um, somebody who's grown up right in that kind of culture? Well, the fair, imagine that um, it's a huge place with a lot of uh, people and uh, in a way, in that uh, place, you have everybody you know, your family, your friends, your relatives, your working mates. So it's like having the chances of meeting everyone you know uh, around each corner. So it's like a very fun issue. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely celebration. And it's not just one night. It goes for an entire week. And what's impressive to me is people go to it. It seems like, every, it seems like the, if you're the, the matriarch or the patriarch of the family, it costs a lot of money to put that tent on and provide all of that food and drink and so on. And you're there, the master of ceremonies. Everybody's having a great time. It is an amazing, uniquely Spanish celebration. It is. It's really something. And I'm thankful that you showed it to us. And, and with your help, we were able to film. And when you go there, just watching it, it sort of stokes my appetite. And I just want to kind of show off what I'm eating today for our Monday night travel visit to Andalusia. I've got my plate of tapas. Oh, baby, look at that. I've got my wow. patatas bravas. Oh, with croquettes with the brava sauce. I've got my manchego cheese and my, my exquisite jamón with my toast and then I've got my banderilla and we're going to talk about all of these things but I want to talk first about about my banderilla because I've never made a banderilla before but that's pretty good wouldn't you say Concepcion? It looks nice yeah. <laughs> I've never, I went to a market um, in uh, Arcos de la Frontera and it was a wonderful market and they had these things it's a it's a skewer with pickles and cheese and spicy sausage and olives and pimiento. And they say it's a banderilla. It looks like the bangled spear that the matador will put into the bull at the beginning of the bullfight. What is the name of that spear? Banderilla. Banderilla. So this is a banderilla. Sí, sí. And when I ate it, the woman in the market said this will be an explosion of flavor. And Exactly. And I, I just wove this together tonight and I'm almost afraid to eat it because that looks like a lot of flavor right there, doesn't it? Looks like. <laughs> but I'm going to do that and I'm going to be so full of food and excitement inside my mouth. I'm going to let you describe what you're eating as I after I take this bite because I don't want to talk with my mouth full and I want to enjoy the flavor, but wish me well. Okay, good luck. Wish me well in Spanish. <laughs> Buena suerte. Buena suerte. <laughs> Wow, I ate it all. There it is, all in my mouth. Okay. All of a sudden, I can hear the sound or the explosion of the olive. And now I can feel some cheese here or it's a pepper instead. Well, mm, it's red pepper, it's green pepper. Well, I'm thinking about it, mm, but it's yummy and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Absolutely. I want anybody, another one. <laughs> anybody can do this. You can spear your favorite pickles, put them in, and then a Spanish explosion. What are you eating, um, Concepcion? Do you have some food there? I have some, yeah, some tapas around. As a start, as you, I have my jamón with some mm. uh, breadsticks that, you know, we like so much. Mm -hmm. And then I have a variety of smaller tapas. Let's see if I don't break anything at all. So I have my tortilla, my Spanish omelette, my tortilla española. I have some croquetas. Mm -hmm. I have olives, of course. And uh, salmorejo. Mm. Um, Concepcion, can you put the big plate down and, and show us a closer look at your salmorejo? Here it goes. Mm. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's like, we all know gazpacho, but this is kind of a special cousin of gazpacho. It's very similar in taste, although it's different in his texture. El salmorejo is from Cordoba, 
and um, it's way thicker because there is bread yep. on it and that makes it uh, have that different uh, texture and, and comes with some ham and boiled egg. So good. And hang on, hold, hold it up again because I'm just getting excited looking at it. Um, this is a good word to know when you're traveling because you can find this on the menus more than gazpacho. Sí. And it's, really good. it's like, a, it's like a, a meal right there. It's got some egg and some ham and some, it's just a beautiful thing, especially in the summer, a cold, fresh soup like that is great. Thank you Absolutely. for sharing that. I looked for it in Seattle, but I couldn't find it. And then you've got your croqueta. I've got, mm -hmm. I've got my, this, this is the closest thing I could put together today. For <laughs> <laughs> <In> English. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just between you and me, we call this tater tots, okay? So this is, uh, uh, you have the real croquetta, but the croquetta is a potato ball filled with good <laughs> fillings and then with some spicy tomato sauce, brava sauce, right? Why not? Something to try. <laughs> so tell us about your croquetta. What do you have? My croquetas are, today I show is croquetas of puchero, the... The most often found croqueta is the one filled with jamón, croqueta de jamón, but instead I chose the variety of puchero, which is with meat inside. Meat. And, you know, the, all of the Andalusians that I know, they love their croqueta. It's an easy way of making children eat everything because you can feel the croqueta out of whatever, from tuna, uh, bull's tail, uh, mushrooms, spinaches, and uh, as it's fried, uh, kids find it exciting and they eat it as a nugget or whatever when it, there's something else inside. There we go. Okay, so now we've had a little bit of food, a little bit of welcome Concepcion. We're gonna go now to Holy Week, Semana Santa. And uh, East, I think the Spanish celebrate Easter with more gusto along with the Greeks than anybody else in Europe. And you were our fixer for our TV show when we were in um, Sevilla for Semana Santa, Holy Week, a few years ago. And you reminded me that Palm Sunday in Spain is celebrated with as much enthusiasm as Easter Sunday. So the, the season lasts a long time. And in Sevilla and in Andalusia, there's lots of tradition, lots of processions, lots of music, lots of drama, lots of emotion, lots of love. We're gonna go right now to Samana Santa together and see what that's like. In Spain, Holy Week is called Samana Santa. Oh, and before we do this, I, I see some cone-shaped hats there. And I just, every time I share these clips, Americans frankly freak out when they see a cone-shaped hat because they think any cone-shaped cap, if it's white, is a KKK and a racist symbol. And I always want to remind them, history did not start with the United States and slavery. It goes back centuries and centuries before that. And for many centuries before there was a KKK, people were wearing white cone hats as if you would think of in the South of the United States for KKK, but they have nothing to do with racism and interracial sort of strife. You have a cone hat right next to you there. They come in different colors. Tell us about that cone hat, please. Now, this is what we wear when doing the penitency, when the Holy Week uh, is organized, people can parade as penitents, that's the point. You know, during those days, you're trying to, uh, well, uh, think of your scenes and so on, and you do your own penitency and the cone, it's its something that somehow bothers and hurts, is the, is the penitency you do. And um, that keeps you, keeps the scar, so you can hide your face, no? So this is what keeps the scar tied to your head in a way. Uh-huh. And you know, the interesting thing is there are different colors for different fraternities, is that right? Correct. No, I have, for example, here, I have this, uh, instead of a teddy bear, <laughs> this was one of the first uh, things we bought for our child when he was just a baby. And this is in blue, is the color of one of the fraternities of Sevilla. Here we have purple and black for my parents' fraternity, while my husband and children belong to another one, is white and black, black and white, sorry. The most scaring is the full white, and we have a few. Uh, like that in Sevilla, which is the one that scares the American the most, especially when they see the Nazarenos with their candles lit and their white <laughs> and stuff. But so when, uh, there's nothing to be scared of. When a, Siviano, a, a Sevillan person sees a white cone hat like that, they don't think KKK and racism and burning. Not crime. at all. It's kind Not of at all. You no. know, I'm, I'm a historian and I, I pride myself in seeing things in a bigger um, historical context. 
than a lot of people who just see it in our narrow sort of way. But the irony is a lot of people, you know, of course the cone head of a, of a, of a racist KKK member is talking about racism, one race being superior to the other. The cone hat and the mask, where you just are looking through the holes of the eye, it makes everybody the same. And I've had people in Spain tell me the symbolism there is we're all equal in God's eyes, equally precious, equally lovable. It's the opposite of racism. So thank you for the explanation. And I just wanted to break in there because we're going to have a few of these cone hats. And I just don't want any of my travelers to ever freak out when they see a cone hat, because freaking out at a cone hat is pretty ethnocentric because it's a big world and it goes back a lot farther than our history. Here we go. It's celebrated with unrivaled pageantry and emotion, most famously in Seville or Sevilla. Here, Semana Santa is an epic event that stirs the soul and captivates all who participate. On Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, families dressed up for this important day head into their parish church for mass. Then, promenading with palm and olive branches, they make a loop through the neighborhood, eventually returning to their home church. Afterwards, they visit other churches throughout the city, each displaying elaborate floats. Sevilla has many religious brotherhoods or fraternities that are entrusted with the care of venerable floats that carry statues of Christ and the Virgin Mary through the streets during Semana Santa. So by the way, these fraternities, we don't really know much about religious fraternities, but Americans know about the Lions Club and the Elks Club and the, and the Rotary Club service clubs. You could say a fraternity in, in Europe, and you see them in different countries, is they have their clubhouses, they have their special colors and their special traditions. It's a lot like an Elks Club or a Rotary Club, but with a religious focus and a service mission. Sevianos hold a special place in their hearts for Mary. Floats with Mary evoke great emotions and remind them of the grieving mother who has lost her only son. Every neighborhood church has its own unique Mary. All are the grieving mothers of the crucified Christ but each one represents a different aspect of her sorrow. And there are other floats. This one, nicknamed La Buraquita, or the Little Donkey, depicts Jesus' grand entrance into Jerusalem. La Buraquita leaves its church and begins its procession through the narrow streets. This marks the official start of Holy Week. From now on, every day until Easter Sunday, the city is enlivened with dozens of such processions. And we'll, we'll illustrate that in a moment, but I just want to remind you, when you see a big float like this kind of wafting through the town and swaying like this, there's 10 or 15 or 20 men underneath that bent their heads down with their heads wrapped, walking with a rhythm to carry that thing. And they don't just do it for six blocks. They do it for six hours or longer. It's an amazing sort of um, commitment to this whole procession and nobody even sees them except for their tennis shoes below the, the robe of the floating float. These ritual parades first filled the streets of Sevilla 400 years ago. They're designed to present the story of the passion, the death and resurrection of Jesus in a way the average person could understand. Today, some 60 fraternities each make the journey on foot, carrying floats and processions like these from their parishes to the city's cathedral and back. The journey through miles of passionate crowds can take up to 14 hours. Strongmen called costaleros work in shifts. As a team, they bear two tons of weight on their shoulders, an experience they consider a great honor despite and indeed because of the great pain involved. As the floats slowly make their way to the cathedral, moments of great passion occasionally bring everything to a standstill. Centuries of flamenco singers have serenaded Mary and Jesus with love songs as they process through the city. Traditionally spontaneous, these passionate songs occur when a singer is so overcome with emotion, he must break into song.
Wow. Concepcion, when, when you experience some emotional outpouring like that, what do you think? That you're in the right place at the right time, in the right moment of your life. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's like a rounded moment, I would say. A rounded moment. Every, I got to remind people there's, there's two kinds of people in that crowd. There's tourists with selfie sticks and there are people who are there for the moment. Take your photographs, but be there. Do whatever you can to be there. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what you think about his voice. Understand that this is integral to the cultural weave of this, of this community. As dusk settles on Sevilla, a long line of silent, black-clad penitents escort one of the city's most moving floats toward the cathedral. The float portrays the dead Jesus taken down from the cross and mourned by the people who loved him most. Among the most dramatic of the week's processions, the float is decorated simply with purple iris and a single red rose symbolizing the blood Jesus shed. As night closes in, penitence candles sway like fireflies dancing in the dark. The entire Holy Week in Spain is a glorious spectacle. After a full day, it's hard to imagine more. And then, the Mary known as Estrella appears, ethereal and radiant. A shower of petals rains down upon her as if heaven itself is thanking her for her immense and loving sacrifice. Wow. It was quite a scramble to be at the right place at the right time with our camera. Can you remember that? Yes, I can. Very, very much, yeah. Those are beautiful images, but the, the, the reality was we were running around, cutting down an alley, trying to get ahead of the procession, being up on a balcony, being in the right place when the flower petals <laughs> were coming down. It was so exciting <laughs> to capture that and to bring it home and to share it with yeah. all of the countrymen here. Thank you for helping us do that. I got to remind people, every time I go to Sevilla, a month before, I'll email or telephone Concepcion and ask her if she can be with me for a couple of days as I'm working on the book. And, you know, this is one of my favorite books that I've, I've written, and it's a big, fat book. And a big chapter in this big, fat book is Sevilla, and that has Concepcion written all over it. And um, Concepcion, you do, um, you do your own walking tours. Um, and we've got your website listed in the chat section there so people can learn about your tours and they can meet you. And they're small tours, what, 10 or 15 people and uh, it, it's not expensive and you can show them an intimate walk through your town and it's your livelihood and it's a great experience for people. So I'm so happy to support you on that. And, um, you know, we've not been able to travel for two years. I just put together my schedule here. This is what I'll be doing for uh, 40 days and 40 nights in Europe coming up. I wish uh, Sevilla was on that list, but you can see there's a lot of exciting towns on that list. Mm -hmm. And um, we're gonna get to Europe this April, God willing, and we're gonna update all the books and we're gonna have a lot of travelers coming back and putting you hardworking guides back in business. And I wanna remind people that there's bucket list travel. And of course you gotta see this and see that and see that and check it off. But you also gotta do the non-bucket list travel. I was in Granada a couple of years ago and I just, pulled out my iPhone and I do these goofy little iPhone videos and I'm flipping around making everybody seasick with my, my pans, uh, but it just captures the spontaneity of the moment. And I've got a two minute little clip right here I wanna share. And it's in Granada, the other great Andalusian city other than Sevilla and Cordoba. And uh, it just is an example of if you're out on the streets, ready to have a good time, it's all around you. There's serendipity there for you to embrace and you got to get out there and do it. This is not a special um, sort of festival. This is just another after, maybe it's a Saturday afternoon in any interesting city in Southern Spain. Join me right now for just a little bit of in spontaneous craziness in Andalusia. Hola, I'm Rick Steens. I'm in Granada in Andalusia. And uh, this city, just stepping into a bar, and uh, everywhere you look, there's just 
there's this conviviality. I mean, there's ham hocks hanging from the ceiling. There's people finishing up great lunches. It's 3 30, 4 o'clock. When you order a drink, you get a free little tapa for free. So one tip is, Whenever you order a drink, don't ask for food because if you expect to get the free tapa, you'll get the free tapa. And Concepcion, is that still true? If you order a drink, it comes with a little plate of food for free? That happens in certain parts of Andalusia. In Sevilla, it's not the case, but in Granada or Jaén, that's still the case. And sometimes it's very generous tapas. Yeah, so you spend $3 for a, a glass of wine or something and it comes with a plate of food. Or even less, or you pay even less and it comes with a yeah. dish of food. So the point is, don't say, I want um, a glass of wine and a plate of ham. Say, I want a glass of wine and say it like you expect to get the food with it as if you're a local person. Because people being people, you know, a, a bartender may give the local people the free dish and the tourists not. But if you look around and see if people are getting that free dish, expect it and you'll get it. And then you can order another dish and pay for it. Later on, you can grab the menu. But here we got all of this energy. And then stepping outside, it's just, I mean, guys are getting married. It's a stag party or a hen party. Happy, happy! happy. 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 <laughs> Behind the Moogle. Your goodbye to freedom. And uh, you got the tuna band here. These tuna bands are troubadours that go all the way back to medieval times. And uh, it's time for a sandwich break, but uh, hello, hello. And they, they'll, ah, it's a happy girl. Hey, hey, hey. So. And Concepcion, this is a tuna band. Normally, doesn't that come from um, Salamanca? Originally, originally, but they exist all over the country, tied to university. And um, they even wear different colors, so you can tell to which uh, specific degree they belong to, in this case, uh, green. So these guys might be the uh, mathematical department from the local university and they're imagine, out there. Imagine. <laughs> and they go and they, they play for fun, they play for tips, and they play professionally for weddings and so on. See, and, and mainly they pray for, for drinks. No, it's, 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 so they they are singing, so you, they get invited to one drink or two, but you can also hire them in a more professional way for a wedding or a party or a hen's party, something they're like a, that. They're a lot of fun. If you see a tuna band, it has nothing to do with the fish. It just, I don't no, know. No. What tuna band. It's, a, it's a great tradition, like troubadours, medieval troubadours. The tuna band. Yeah. So even in a sandwich break. <laughs> Oh my By the way, this is one take. This is one spontaneous take. No planning, just walking down the street and looking around with my camera rolling. It's just a fun-loving corner of Europe, and you know, it's no special day. This is just this is just the way it is when you're out on the streets having a good time in Andalusia. And uh, of course, you can take a few steps away from the from the craziness, and you can catch your breath, and then you can dive back into the cultural thickness of it all. But uh, here's another bar. I don't even know what this bar is, but I would imagine if you stepped inside, you'd find a wonderful environment with more ham hocks and this kind of conviviality and your vermouth right from the cask. And there you see your vermouth. It's a cask of vermouth. That's what I'm drinking right here. You see vermouth, but you don't generally order it. There's nothing wrong with pointing to that and saying, I'll have a glass of that. There's even a word in Spain, uh, there's a tradition in Spain of, um, I forget what it is, but it's like we're having a vermouth kind of time. It's sort of convivial. And uh, don't miss the opportunity to, to try a different drink than the drink you always have. It's right out of the cask. And uh, some beautiful tapas. And uh, hello. <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
You don't need a list of sites, that's for sure. You can just be out and about. Happy travels. Happy travels. <laughs> From Andalusia. Ciao. <laughs> I was trying to speak horse in Spanish, but it, it did, it got me nowhere. Hey, now we're going to go, we're going to, you know, Concepcion, normally when I'm with you, it's always Sevilla, Sevilla, Sevilla. I want to show a little bit of Granada and a little bit of Cordoba. When you think about Andalusia, there's three great cities, Granada, Cordoba, and Sevilla, and then lots of great small towns, and then lots of beach resorts. But the three cultural historical capitals, Granada, Cordoba, and Sevilla, all deserve a look. If you were, if an American traveler was thinking about going to Andalusia and they wanted to know how, what's the personality difference of these towns, how would you characterize the three great cities of Andalusia? I don't find huge differences other than Sevilla is much bigger than the rest of the cities in Andalusia because it's the capital and it's the biggest other than the size. Uh, to me, the feeling is very similar. The light is similar, the behavior is similar, the culture is the same, the way of doing things is the same. So I don't find many differences. I'm kind of being Cordoba and feel like home. And uh, other than the accent uh, of uh, the inhabitants, which is slightly different, in in some provinces. So in this case, it's very strong in Granada, very strong in, in Cordoba, and very different in Sevilla. I find no differences. I think all of them uh, could be called my home. I think one difference is, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but Sevilla and Cordoba are connected on the Ave train, the bullet train to Madrid, and Granada is harder to get to? Well, Granada is also connected now with the Ave train. Oh, is that right? Mm. Wow, so things are changing because Granada used to be more difficult. To, and I remember it used to be eight hours to get from Madrid to uh, Sevilla. And now it's like two and a half hours by the Ave. See, see, two, 25, two hours, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And I'm loving my Manchego. <laughs> of course, <laughs> how, how wouldn't you love Manchego? I mean, it's impossible not to love it. I gotta say, I've looked at these shows a lot and I've eaten this food a lot but I've never looked at the shows and eaten this food at the same time. It's a beautiful marriage. I love it. Okay, we're gonna go now to Granada and Cordoba, two towns that uh, Concepcion is not from. For many, a trip to Andalusia starts and ends here on the beach. Sure, the Costa del Sol's great fun and we'll be back for a break later, but I enjoy the heart and soul of this multifaceted region in the interior. After splashing on the sun-soaked beach, we'll dance flamenco in a street party. Slice ham as if it's a gift from heaven. Stumble onto a midnight procession. Admire the splendor of a former Moorish mosque. Cook paella for the entire neighborhood. Shake our castanets to fiery gypsy music. And marvel at the Alhambra. Just north of Africa, Spain sits in the southwest corner of Europe. In its far south is the region of Andalusia. We start in Granada, enjoy Nerja on the Costa del Sol, and finish in Cordoba. Sprawling at the foot of the snow-capped Sierra Mountains, Granada is a thriving city of about 300,000 people. Visitors focus on its old center, where life has a gentility that belies an illustrious past. Once the grandest city in Spain, its power ebbed and glory faded. It was appreciated mostly by Romantic Age artists and poets. Today, it has a deep south feel, a relaxed vibe that seems typical of once powerful places now past their prime. In the cool of the early evening, the community... Once powerful places now past their prime. Think about that. Once powerful places passed their prime. Granada, good example. Vienna, a good example. Naples, a good example. When you travel, there's so much heritage you encounter. Comes out and celebrates life on stately yet inviting plazas. For a time, near the end of its Moorish period, Granada was the grandest city in all of Spain. But eventually, with the tumult that came with the change from Muslim to Christian rule, the city lost its power and settled into a long slumber. Today's Granada is a delightful mix of both its Moorish and its Christian past. 
The silk market, or Alcaceria, was originally across the street from the main mosque, so today it stands across from the main church. Filled with precious goods, salt, silver, spices, and silk, it was protected within 10 fortified gates. Today, while a tourist trap housed in a modern reconstruction, this colorful mesh of shopping lanes and overpriced trinkets is fun to explore. You'll invariably meet persistent gypsy women, pushing their fragrant sprigs and palm reading and then demanding payment. You can consider them aggressive and annoying, or you can zip up your valuables and have a fun and spirited give and take. A handy minibus service loops from downtown through Spain's best old Moorish quarter, the Albaicín. Increasingly around Europe, minibuses wind locals through narrow lanes of old quarters. Tourists can hop on for a cheap and scenic joyride. By the way, I love this one. You can take a little local transit. This is bus 31. It goes around and around through the old quarter. It's a little bus because the big buses couldn't fit down the narrow lanes. That's the kind of bus I use as a, uh, a way for American or in international tourists to sort of freeload on the local public transportation. For just a dollar, you buy a ticket and you can go around and jump off wherever you want in the old town. We can let that be the spine of a guided tour. And that's these are the kind of places I'll be listing for sure in this guidebook. LBC with flowery patios and shady lanes is a delight. Exploring these labyrinthine back lanes and inviting neighborhood squares, you feel the Arab heritage that permeates so much of Andalusia. Enjoy a drink on a no-name square. Savor the lazy tempo of Granada life. An alternative community of young people nicknamed Pie de Negro, or Black Feet for their basic earthiness, hangs out in the Albicin. <laughs> Ah, I love this song, but I have no idea what, what they're singing about. Do you know the lyrics to this, Concepcion? This is a very famous song, which was composed for the closing act of the Olympics in Barcelona in 1992. So this is only from 1992? Yes. I thought it was a big traditional thing that went back to the old, old, old days, but it's interesting. <laughs> Not really, because, you know, the rumba keeps on evolving, and uh, this is a uh, rumba catalana. Rumba catalana. Oh, well, that's interesting. And Catalan, of course, is the state around Barcelona. A reminder that Spain is so diverse. There's four. You can go to a Subway sandwich uh, off, uh, shop and see a menu, and the sandwiches are in four different languages, depending on where you are. And here we have this wonderful music in the streets. And Granada. By the way, I used the word gypsy, and some people think that's politically incorrect, but in the in the context of Spain, the gypsies are called gypsies, aren't they? What, what is your take on, on that issue, Concepcion? Gitanos, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. They are gitanos and they are proud to be gitanos. I mean, it's, it's, it's the way it is. They are gitanos and, and that's it, gypsies. There's even a popular musical group, the Gypsy Kings. The Gypsy Kings. They don't, they don't say the Roma kings. No, no, the gypsy kings. So here we're going to go into the gypsy neighborhood of, of Granada, which is Sacramonte. It is home to tens of thousands of gypsies, or Roma people. While their nomadic culture makes traditional employment a challenge, one vocation in which they excel is music. In the evening, in the hilly Sacramonte district, gypsy families entertain tourists with colorful folkloric shows. These intimate concerts are performed in the very caves that once housed Granada's gypsy community. Ho! Oh. Man, oh man, when I, when I, when I hear that, I get, you do too, Concepcion, you, you, you have to, your body moves. <laughs> I mean, look at, when I look at her, I don't know if you can, you can see it, her, her eyes are just direct, you know, and it's just this powerful emotion, this passion, this duende, the soul. If, if you're looking for flamenco, would this be what you talk about flamenco? 
This would be flamenco, of course, that's uh, pure flamenco. And uh, besides, you can see that they even have no mic, mic so it's a, it's a very intimate uh, show and could be fun, yeah. Now this is Sacramante and there's lots of con artists and ripoffs in Sacramante, but if you're smart and common sense and leave your valuables at the hotel, these are all tourists gathered around in this cave. I, I think we're having a wonderful time. I'll never forget, it was a beautiful evening. Uh, so just, you know, there's, um, you need to be careful, but it's a beautiful place for flamenco. When people are going to Spain, they want to hear flamenco. And there's a place in Barcelona, you can hear flamenco, but I also, I always think Catalonia is not the place for flamenco. What is your strategy for a tourist to enjoy good quality flamenco? I mean, first of all, let's remember that the flamenco was born in Andalusia. So it was born between Sevilla and Jerez, Cadiz. So this is the area of flamenco, Sevilla, Jerez, Malaga. So I would say Andalusia is, of course, the best place where to enjoy a flamenco. But also consider that the flamenco, it's um, for professionals. And they only dance or sing on stage. Therefore, and there's nothing wrong with attending a show because it's the only way of experiencing real uh, flamenco. I mean, there's something you cannot find around a corner and someone is, no, it, yeah. you need to attend a professional thing. Yeah, so there's other kinds of dancing that you can do just on the fly, but this is a serious cultural um, art. Exactly. And, uh, and, you know, it's alive because there are stage shows and and uh, the, the most expensive ones and the leading artists may be in Madrid, but I think Sevilla is the place. Every night there's four or five quality flamenco performances in Sevilla for about $20 for the hour. Sí, correct. And uh, even uh, every two years, Sevilla is hosting La Bienal de Flamenco, which is in October, September, October. And for about 45 days, we have the best performers on stage in many uh, theaters. So if every, every, every coming in wow. the fall, it's nice to check about that. I would love to go to that because I get swept away in it, really. And uh, I know every time I'm in Sevilla, you and I spend the better part of an evening looking, visiting every one of the touristic flamenco venues to, to assess the quality and the value. And it's a beautiful experience and we always have a good time. Hmm. <laughs> Along with gypsies and hippies, Tolerant Granada has a sizable Muslim population. A modern mosque built in 2003 fits in with the local architecture and comes with a live call to prayer. The muezzin cries, God is great, from the minaret without amplification, as non-Muslim neighbors insisted. There are about 700,000 Muslims in Spain, and that includes nearly 10% of Granada's residents. To learn more, we're joined by Malik Basso, a member of Granada's Muslim community. So we should remember, Europe has the same immigrant challenges that we have in the United States. We have people in Mexico that are desperate and want to work and they'll do work that we don't want to work, do for less money. So they come over the border and they do that work. And you can think of all the places that Hispanic workers help us out here in the more affluent United States of America. Same thing in Europe. Europe is an affluent continent. North Africa is poor and struggling. Consequently, lots of people come from North Africa who happen to be Muslim and Arab, and they come into Europe. In the case of Spain, many are coming over legally or illegally, from Morocco and, and other places in North Africa. They cross the Strait of Gibraltar, and they're going through Spain to get to France. Uh, there's a lot of connection with France because of its colonial history. Consequently, a lot of um, uh, North African Muslim communities speak French, and they want to get to France. And all across Southern France, you got lots of immigrant laborers doing the same work and having the same struggles that Hispanic workers are having in the United States. Here in Granada, 10% of the population is Muslim and counterintuitively, they're not just immigrants coming in from Africa, but there's a lot of people whose families have chosen to be Muslim. They're, um, they embrace that religion. And in Granada, you actually have a mosque that we're in right now that is the first time in 500 years in Southern Spain where they built a mosque, a modern mosque for the local communities worshiping needs. Would you say most of the Spanish Muslims are immigrant laborers coming over from Africa for better jobs? Yes, Moroccans, uh, Algerians, Turks, uh, Pakistanis, but of course there is uh, the recent phenomenon of Spanish Muslims as well. Because you were, you're Spanish? Yes, I'm, I'm from Barcelona. So tell me a little bit about this mosque. Well, it was the first mosque built in Granada 
after the Reconquista. So for 500 years, this was the first purpose-built mosque in Granada. It was uh, promoted by a lot of people who were native uh, Spanish Muslims, born and raised in Spain, although it caters for all the Muslims. So how has the process been with community relations? Well, some people were fearful at first, you know, the uh, effect of the media and, and such. Uh, but 10 years later, here we are, and some of our uh, most vocal opponents are now our best friends because they appreciate what we're doing and, and who we are. The mosque stands next to one of Europe's most romantic viewpoints. From the St. Nicholas Terrace, as the sun sets, locals and visitors alike enjoy both a historic backdrop and a convivial moment. To extend the magic, grab a prime table at one of several historic Albicene manor houses called Carmen's for dinner. You'll pay a bit more, but I can't think of a better way to cap your visit to Granada. From Granada, it's a two-hour drive over the mountains and down into Europe's Fun in the Sun headquarters, the Costa del Sol. I find this strip of Mediterranean coastline generally overbuilt and very commercialized. Malaga, the major city of the coast, is a good place to pass through. And almost anything even resembling a quaint fishing village is long gone. Replaced by timeshare condos and golf courses. The big draw is the beaches. There are plenty of hotels and sun worshippers enjoy themselves in spite of the congestion and lack of charm or local culture. In spite of the lack of local culture, I mean, it's filled with Northern Europeans going all the way to the southern beach of Europe in order to get a change of weather, but not wanting a change of culture. Consequently, you've got enclaves of Belgian, Dutch, German, Irish, Danish Europeans that are living down there because they like the sunshine. A lot like snowbirds here in the United States. Concepcion, when you want to go to the beach, where do you like on the Costa del Sol? To me, La Costa del Sol is a little far away because uh, from where I live, which is Sevilla, uh, I'm more um, occidental. So we prefer to go to the beaches of Huelva or Cadiz, which are Atlantic uh, coast okay. or beaches. What is that coastline called? La Costa del, de la Luz. Okay, so there's the Costa de la Luz and the Costa del Sol. La Costa del Sol is Mediterranean. Okay, so if you think about the south beaches of Spain, of Spain, you got Gibraltar right here. On one side, you got the Mediterranean, and the other side, you got the Atlantic. The tourists mostly go to the Mediterranean side. It's a little calmer, a little warmer water, a little more resorty. And uh, the locals probably go to the less expensive, less commercialized, um, windier uh, Atlantic coast. Not only less commercialized, but um, you don't find that many foreigners. So you, you just find people that uh, come from Andalusia, uh, actually. So. Oh, so you like to go to a restaurant where the where the menu has Spanish on it? For example. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nearly every country from Europe's drizzly north tucks an expatriate community somewhere along this coast. They don't want to leave their culture, just their weather. My favorite Costa del Sol stop is the resort town of Nerja. While capitalizing on the holiday culture, Nerja has retained some of its charm. The church fronts the square, which fronts the beach, and everybody's out strolling, eventually winding up on the proud Balcony of Europe terrace. This bluff, jutting jauntily into the sea, overlooks miles of coastline. A castle occupied this spot for centuries. Nerja's castle was part of a 16th century lookout oh. system after Reconquista forces drove out the Muslim... Oh, that's right. You don't come to the Costa del Sol for history. You... Come on, I wanted to hear about the Reconquista forces. Tell me about Ferdinand, Isabella. <laughs> come on. Fun in the sun. And relaxation. And relax is what countless expat residents do. Nerja's expats are mostly British. Like many along this coast, they actually try not to integrate. They enjoy their English TV and radio, and many barely learn a word of Spanish. Nerja has several well-equipped beaches. The one just below town retains its fishing village charm. Fishermen do their thing, while the tourists do theirs. 
the humble cottage evokes a bygone day. Spaniards love their little beach restaurants. A short hike takes us to a broader beach that appeals to different tastes. While it's packed through the summer, we're here in May when the heat and crowds are just right. Ayo's place is famous for its beachside all-you-can-eat paella feast. For 30 years, he's been cooking up this classic Spanish specialty. To create this culinary work of art, start with some junk pallets for fuel and slip on your handmade heat shields. Then, fry up as many pieces of chicken as can fit in the pan. Add just a pinch of garlic and about a week's pay's worth of saffron. When the chicken is golden brown, add a dozen skinned tomatoes and as many red and green peppers as you can stand chopping. Stir everything with a clean shovel. Now, add a laundry bin of arboreal rice and just a dash of smoked sweet pimentos. Stir briskly until the rice has become coated with the oils and spices. Add a few gallons of stock and bring to a boil. Add another pallet if necessary. Mix in a boatload of fresh whole shrimp. When the rice is done, remove, remembering to lift with your knees, and let set for 10 minutes. Now, you could just stare at the pretty colors and textures, but I recommend eating it for the full experience. Dish out servings daintily and garnish with a wedge of lemon. Feeds 48 hungry vacationers. Adjust recipe measurements accordingly. <coughs> wow, that is quite a feast. Concepcion, people love paella. I think Spaniards love paella, Andalusians love paella, tourists love paella. When you think of paella, that was um, sort of a beach resort kind of paella for the travelers. What, what, what makes a good paella? What does paella mean to you? Well, actually, um, paella is quite connected to the beach um, uh, here in Andalusia because uh, it takes so long to have a paella ready. That is quite common that when you are uh, spending time on the beach, you go down to the sand and in your way, you pass by the restaurant, you order your paella. And we want a paella for six at 3 p.m. And when you're in your way back, it's ready for you. So it's quite connected to the beach. Okay, now in your family, what's, what is the paella tradition? In my family, my husband cooks it because as I'm telling you, it takes so long that I have no patience for that. <laughs> so he's the one who spends the whole Sunday morning having the or having all the arrangements for the paella to be ready for 3 p.m. <laughs> so it's kind of like the barbecue in the United States, the, the guys do that. And... It's, a, it's a social day, it's the day when the whole family gathers and you may invite your mother-in-law or whatever for the paella. And you know, my, my best traveler's tip for paella is if you're in a taverna, and a taverna is not like a dark tavern here. It's a tavern is a, is a warm and convivial and inviting place, a little charming in, a, in informal restaurant. When you're in a taverna and if somebody yells paella, that means they've just cooked a big, big platter of paella and they dish it up into small tapas portions and they're walking around and, and you just got to say yes. See <laughs> right here. I want some because one it's for me. fresh. One for me. It's out of the oven because my, I think most tourists, they end up seeing paella that's been sitting there for three hours and old paella. It's, it's, it's not good. No, but not at all. You fresh. want it to be just made in that moment. So they cook it once a day and it's for lunch normally because it's a lunch dish. Okay. And when it's over, it's over till tomorrow. So they know they're going to cook one of those big things of paella. They'll sell it. They'll make some money and everybody will love it. And they won't have to be burdened by the old, boring, disappointing paella. Hmm. Speaking of old and boring, I want to talk about Gabe. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gabe, I'm so thankful for Gabe and for Julianne and for Lisa and our crew here at Monday Night Travel because we couldn't have all this fun, Concepcion, and all of you who are watching right now, if we didn't have our crew laboring long and hard to make sure we know just what to say and all the tech stuff is gonna work and your questions are answered and the links are there and everything goes smoothly. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Julianne. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. And I want to remind you, we're going to be answering questions in just a few minutes. If you got any questions, that's what Q and A means. You do the Q, we do the A. It's going to happen in just a few minutes. So ask your questions there. 
also in the chat section, we've got links. If I was a tourist going to Sevilla, after I got my hotel, the most important link, and if I had my Rick Steves guidebook to Spain, including all the great sites of Andalusia, the most important link is Concepcion Delgado, this wonderful guide that's with us tonight. She has a website, she has a link, and she's got a wonderful circle of friends and Concepcion and her colleagues do these wonderful tours. And I got the great delight of helping Concepcion with her dream, her vision of giving travelers a cultural moment, just a couple of hours of beautiful cultural experience. And Concepcion, are you still doing your walks coming up after we come out of this pandemic? Yeah, well, I have uh, been offering them uh, with more or less uh, customers, but I still do that because that's what I love. Just, uh, assisting yeah. people and showing, sharing my culture and showing them around for a while. You've been doing this for 20 years. How do you not get bored about it and just sort of jaded? Does it get very, does it stay fresh somehow? I think so, because as people change, everything changes and Sevilla yeah, changes. So the city changes all throughout the year. I don't, I don't have a set tour. My tour changes according to the season, according to what's going on in town, according to the customers that I have and their interests. So I'm it's adapting myself every day to what I have. It's a beautiful thing. And you're right. You can't give the same tour twice. And all you're talking about is this intimate look at the culture of Andalusia as a cultural scavenger hunt as you walk through your beautiful town. Hey, right now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I think that we want to have a little more time for Q&A. And I'm going to just drop in on a restaurant here in Cordova. Others will sit down to a classic Andalusian dinner. Isabel has invited us to Bodegas Campos, a historic and venerable house of eating for our own festival of Andalusian specialties. Oh, my goodness. And this, it happens to be a restaurant I really love in Cordoba with another wonderful local guide, Isabella. And if you look at this food, it was beautifully filmed, but it is a lot of the film, the food that you would eat in Sevilla if you're going out with the Concepcion also, but it is just delightful. And here in Andalusia, no special meal starts without the porcine gold standard, jamón ibérico. This is a special good one. Jamón. Jamón ibérico. Why does it taste? Iberico. It's worth spending triple. For, for all of my youth, I would not, I would cheap out and I would get the jamón serrano. Well, it's still ham. This is jamón serrano. I want Iberico. <laughs> show me your, can you show me your jamón Iberico? Look. Show it closer. I'm just, I'm really lonely. Look okay. At <laughs> oh, and those, that's from little pigs that were acorn fed with black. The, only the last part of their lives. Only the last part of their lives. And then they were butchered just for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> look at no. that beautiful. Look, at it, it's worth spending. Life is too short to eat mediocre ham. It really is. <laughs> so good. The jamón ibérico. Because the pig lived outside. Okay, so we're running around. It's free. After the jamón ibérico, the plates just keep on coming. This place specializes in traditional... Is that salmorejo there? There we go. That's the we, word I have. We were dish. talking about, it's like thick gazpacho Andalusian style. It is so good. Andalusian fare. Rustic food that originated with the peasantry. And a few dishes have a Moorish influence. But if there's one common denominator to all the food, it's... Olive oil. Definitely. The finale, definitely for carnivores only, is pork from the Iberian black pig and what could be more Spanish, bull's tail. We've had nine different plates. Yeah, we love eating and we love sitting around the table for hours. It's living well. Yeah, that's Andalusian lifestyle. You want a recipe for a wonderful trip? Blend history, culture, local friends, and great food. I hope you've enjoyed our look at... All right, and I'm gonna move a little bit ahead here, and then we're gonna to go to the tapas bar. So Concepcion, here we are in Sevilla, and we're in a neighborhood, and I was just struck with how I love neighborhoods in my community where the moms and dads are there with the kids and the dogs, and anywhere you travel in Europe, you can find these same beautiful, intimate looks at the local community. Uh, this could be anywhere in the world, 
but we happen to be in the south of Spain. Check it out. I'm in Sevilla, and I'm with my good guide, Concepcion. Hola. Maybe you know Concepcion from TV. She's my beautiful fixer whenever we're making TV in Sevilla. All day long, I've been with uh, Concepcion looking at great cathedrals and great palaces. And we're walking now, and what do we find? Kids. Kids. Children in Sevilla. <laughs> There's a real people. Now, I, I don't know, it just seems kind of strange, but I'm just going to walk you through this city park. And this was on the old Roman Forum, and I'll try not to be in my tour guide mode. But this is just a reminder when we travel, these are real communities. Check out the families on the square, the kids playing on top of the ancient Roman Forum. And remember, Europe is communities. And the big difference between this and the scene like this in my town is this is on what used to be a Roman forum 2,000 years ago. I don't know why, but this really just shocked me because I get, I forget a lot of times that you're surrounded by neighborhoods. And that's an important thing to remember in our travels, to get out, walk through the neighborhoods and just imagine the whole world is filled with families kicking the soccer ball. There you go. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, now we're gonna to go to Ronda and we're gonna to go to a tapas bar and we're gonna have fun with a very accessible menu and another wonderful tour guide. I'm so blessed to have these tour guide friends all over Europe. Every city I go to, I've got tour guide friends and you can too. All you gotta do is book them. Hola, I'm Rick Steves and I'm with my friend Jesus. Jesus, hola. And we're in, what is the name of this restaurant or this bar? Lechuguita. Le Lechuguita. And uh, Jesus came here as a, as a student many, many years ago. <laughs> He's eating with his mouth. And the great thing about this place is you have a, a list. So we're in Ronda. And Ronda is a wonderful town in the route of the Pueblos Blancos, the mountain south of uh, Sevilla. Ronda is the biggest town. And look at here. All of these tapas are 80 cents each. That's $1 each for these plates. Uh, Concepcion, I don't know if you can read this, but can you read that? Which, which, uh, if you were gonna, if I was gonna, I want to buy you a tapa. Which one would you like? I can. I've got eighty cents for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's very generous of you. I would go to number twenty-seven. Pisto. Pisto. Number two. I see it there. Pisto. What is pisto? Pisto is like ratatouille. It's like what? Like ratatouille. Is oh. the is a lot of uh, vegetables cut into okay so Spanish ratatouille. You know what I would like is number five. It's with you fine. <laughs> snails, <laughs> big snails, caracoles grandes. I would say you should go for gallos instead. Number four. What are gallos? Gallos. That's the tribes, the intestines. Oh, that... Right. It's it's guts. <laughs> it's the guts of the uh, of the cow. Mm -hmm. Do you have 80? I need to borrow 80 cents. <laughs> okay, so you could you could put five or six of these together for a five dollar dinner. And you just choose anything on this list and it costs 80 cents. 80 cents is about one dollar. How do you say 80 cents in Espanol? <clears throat> 80 centimos. And you get anything here. So what do we have? We have the salad. We have the this is pisto. Pisto? And underneath this little piece of bread is well, that's what you said, pisto. With a quail egg. Mm -hmm. A little smaller than a chicken egg. Quail. And then we have. The... And here's my caracoles grande. <laughs> Escargot. And in Spanish, we say. What do we say in Spanish? Caracoles. Caracoles. And I have a little beer. And a little beer is a caña, of course. Of course. Espanol. <laughs> bon appetit. In the Six of those little beers equals one German beer.
The name of this bar again is Lechuguita. Lechuguita. And we're spending a little money for a lot of great food. <laughs> Happy travels. You see how hard I have to work in my job. I mean, I, every day I have to hang out with cool people and eat interesting food and, and write about it. <laughs> I love so my, stressful. I, I love my work. And Concepcion, it is so <laughs> great to have you with us. I know you've spent the middle of your night with us. I'm so thankful for that. You, you, you got out all of your beautiful dresses and you've shared with us your, your love of your rich and beautiful culture. So thank you so much. And now, Gabe, I think we have time for some questions. We do. Uh, we actually have a deluge of questions tonight, Rick. Uh, but before we get to those, can we have a quick word from our sponsor? A word from our sponsor? You mean Rick Steves Europe, the company that brings us all this travel joy? That's exactly what I mean. The company that you and I work for and that for two years we've been on hold because of this stinking pandemic. And now we're on the verge of coming out of it when we can go back to Europe and meet people like Concepcion. I, I think exactly. Have, <laughs> I think we have lots to offer. I'm wearing my keep on traveling t-shirt here because I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm, I've just booked my ticket today to go to Europe on March 18. I'm gonna fly straight to London, meet our TV crew. We're gonna make some beautiful work for our art series. And then 12 days later, I'm gonna start researching the guidebooks. And next month, we're gonna start our tour program again. As a matter of fact, let me take you to a wonderful website called ricksteves.com. And at ricksteves.com, you've got a world of information. All of our Monday night travel shows in the archive, 60 shows are saved there. You've got all of the TV shows we've ever made. And what I wanted to do, however, was to take you to our tour section and remind you that we have an exciting schedule of tours this season. And uh, we didn't do any tours last year or the year before. We are confident that we will be able to travel safely. We're not going to travel unless it can be done safely. And we're almost sold out for 2022, but there are lots of seats available out of the 30,000 seats we've got offered. We probably have 27,000 sold. And we've got a, a button here that says seats available. Want to remind you, in February, we've got a few seats open on our Rome tour on our Venice, Florence, and Rome tour, and on our Sicily tour. So you can learn more specifics there. And tonight we've been visiting with uh, Concepcion, who's one of our local guides who we meet with our Spain tours and with our Andalusia tour. And if you look at our Andalusia tour, you can see dates and you can see here, out of all of our Andalusia tours, most of them are in the wait list area, I mean, they're sold out. But the first two departures, April 24 and June 5 have seats available. And as we just learned, April Fair starts on May 1st and it goes for seven days in Sevilla. So there's lots of action in Spain during this period. Do want to remind you, tonight we've been looking at basically the route of the uh, Andalusia tour, Sevilla, Miranda, Granada, and Cordoba. So lots of fun available. And uh, if you're not quite comfortable to travel right now, we've got lots of travel when you do get comfortable traveling because God willing, we're gonna put this pandemic to rest. We're gonna get our vaccinations. We're gonna get our boosters. We're gonna embrace science. We're gonna take care of our neighbors and we're gonna turn our travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. And that is a word from our sponsor. Let's have some questions, Gabe. All right. Our first question this evening comes from Mitchell and is for Concepcion. Uh, Concepcion, Mitchell would like to know, is there a term for those kinds of dresses behind you? And if somebody was in Sevilla, where would be a good place to buy one? Well, that's the flamenco dress, el traje de flamenca, flamenco dress. And um, actually, it's very easy to find them because uh, in the city center, we still have certain streets which only sell certain items. And there is a street, uh, actually, it's, it's two streets very near to each other, where we can find the majority of the flamenco designer stores. So in a couple of minutes, you have found them all uh, together. And Concepcion has taken me to those shops when we do our tour. It's in the Spain guidebook. And it's beautiful. It's right close to the center. And there are wonderful streets with family-run shops and beautiful uh, traditional art in the kind of clothing and, and um, all sorts of artifacts and so on. It's a beautiful thing. Um, our next question comes from Doug and is about flamenco. Um, 
He's wondering, do locals also watch flamenco? And is there a way to experience flamenco like a local um, as opposed to a more touristy flamenco show? Yes. Well, actually, um, even uh, locals learn flamenco, take classes on flamenco. So as a child, I recall that I was attending classes like Nowadays, you attend English classes or whatever, because it becomes practical for the rest of your life. And so there are certain clubs, flamenco clubs, but that's um, not easy for visitors. Uh, but um, other than that, locals have the chances of attending uh, flamenco shows in theaters. Every now and then, we have a famous dancer coming to town. She's in town for three, four days, and then you can enjoy uh, that show. Other than that, we have the rest of the venues, but a local would not attend frequently. And with it, we will wait till someone with, uh, you know, with a new show with the name comes to town, while the rest of the venues, still very professional, are mainly uh, offering that daily for visitors. So I just looked in our book here, and it's on page 736, all of the flamenco places in Sevilla. And uh, you've got the places that Concepcion was just talking about, serious flamenco concerts every night, not expensive, early enough for tourists because Spaniards stay up quite late. And we've got beautiful, um, and they're committed to the culture, the, the, the heritage. So it's a way to keep the heritage alive. Then you got the razzle dazzle flamenco shows for the cruise ships and so on. And then you got the impromptu flamenco in bars. Let me read to you, uh, this is sort of the, um, the place that you might be talking about. La Carbonera Bar, the sangria equivalent of a beer garden, is a few blocks north of the Barrio Santa Cruz, where most of my favorite hotels are. It's a big open tented area filled with young locals, casual guitar strummers, and nearly nightly flamingo music from 10.30 until midnight. Located just a few blocks from my recommended hotels, this is worth finding if you're not quite ready to end the day. No cover every day till very late. So that's where the flamenco would just, it's free, you buy a drink and it's sort of impromptu. It erupts like Irish folk music in a pub. But I would recommend at nine o'clock for $20, you sit down in a comfortable environment and you get a show that's directed to expose you to all the dimensions of flamenco. It's a quality experience. So our next question comes from Scott. Um, in this presentation, you talked about, um, you know, Christianity in Spain, um, Muslim communities in Spain. What sort of Jewish historical sites um, are there in Spain um, or maybe aspects of Jewish culture there? Well, the truth is that um, I would say not, uh, not because I probably, um, Jews were always there, but they were not leading um, people. As a result, we don't have a lot of leftovers. No? So while Muslims were ruling for centuries and they left their buildings and we can still mm. see them standing, or Christians later on were turning many uh, Islamic buildings into their churches, Jewish were always the minority. And we don't have a lot of their buildings. Sadly, there were many synagogues, but turned it into churches as, as it happens with mosques after the Christians took over. And Jews were expelled, as I guess everyone knows, in 1492. So after five centuries, what can you find? Not that much. You can actually find a lot of synagogues in Amsterdam because in 1492, they welcomed the Jews to go up to the Netherlands. And the Netherlands wanted these smart business-like people to come in. And today you've even got a thing called the Spanish synagogue in Amsterdam, which dates back 500 years. Huh, I never knew that. I will need to visit on my next trip to Amsterdam. Um, one question from Gary is, do Spanish families such as yours, Concepcion, make their own tapas? Like, is that something that you would make at home? Or is that really only something that people go out and eat at bars? Well, if you're at home, you obviously cook a big lunch or a big dinner. You're not uh, doing tapas. But if you're inviting friends to come home, 
you would not do something heavy, but based on tapas, you would offer a variety and people will be grabbing here and there. So that's like a tapa because you're getting a small portion out of a big dish, no, somehow. But uh, when you go tapas is the social fact of going with others to have some food and the food is not as important as the time you spend. That's why it comes in little portions. So you can try different things, a variety. And it's a whole conversation, ritual, the meeting, the gathering, what really comes when you mean going tapas. No, it's like going socializing, not just going ah, eating. So it's, it's the focus is uh, it's not a, a gourmet eating experience. The, the food exactly. is incidental. It supports the conversation. Uh, and you need to have a good vocabulary for it to smartly eat tapas as the tourist out and about. Uh, there's the tapa is the little plate. Many times they don't sell it in the tapa dimension. They'll sell it in a half ration or a ration. So a, a, a half ration is like two tapas and a ration, ration is like four or five tapas. So you're going to pay $20 for a plate of ham instead of $4 for a little tapa of ham. Uh, so you need to find a place that has tapas or go with a group of people and order smartly. But the spirit is you share the food, you pick off the plates and you drink your local wine or whatever. Um, along the same lines, we had um, Garlo who was wondering, do people often eat jamón? Like, is it, would a Spanish family have jamón at home or is that also just a special treat? Come on. <laughs> I just threw the leftovers yesterday. I have the whole <laughs> leg. We bought it for Christmas. Normally we buy that uh, three, four times a year. Vale? We do that for Christmas, which is going to be a longer uh, time in family because kids have no school. They are going to be home. So they love ham and we are slicing that. Uh, we also buy one for Holy Week because and again, kids are on holidays and we have more time at home to slice it and eat it and enjoy it for summer <laughs> and then special occasions. So three times for sure. And so I just do the leftovers, the, the leg, well, the, you the buy bones one of those yesterday. Big, you buy a big ham hock. Claro. I have it See right that? here on my wall. I've never taken this down in like five years, but this is one of my <laughs> conceptual. I look at this every morning for breakfast. This is a whole bunch of ham hocks hanging over a whole bunch of booze, <laughs> little upside down umbrellas to catch the dripping fat. I love this stuff. And I've always dreamed about having one of these ham hocks in vice grips right there on my island with a nice sharp knife. And I could cut it off like the, like the bow of a violin, just loving the culture of it all. It's like a ballerina in a vice grip and little slice by slice, you take off the beautiful... Oh my goodness. And you have that in your house routinely all year long? Well, I, 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 I can't afford to have those beautiful jamones on your picture. Uh, we have like paletillas, which is the front leg. The back leg is the fattest, is the most expensive. Is so in my right? family, we buy the paletilla, which is the front uh, legs of yeah. the pig. Not that much meat, but it's a little cheaper. And yeah. I could not afford the pata negra. The black so these, leg. This is the this is the pata negra would be the fancy uh, iberico one. How much the would one of these cost? A pata negra, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a good jamón, an acorn pata negra, hundred percent iberico, that could cost over a thousand euros. A thousand dollars for one of these things, and does it last for as long as it takes to eat it, or do you have to eat it before it goes bad? Well, it, it it lasts for a while, but we are talking about seven eight kilos of jamón. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a thousand a thousand dollars Gabe you're looking a little small. It, I'm going to I'm Concepcion I'll tell you the full story one time but when I studied in Spain I ran a race and I won and my prize was a leg of pata negra jamón <laughs> and wow. I'm a vegetarian so I <laughs> traded it away and when I told my host mama she was livid <laughs> said, why did you not bring it home to me my gosh <laughs> that is so funny a regret i carry <laughs> all right well we have time for one more question um i'm gonna ask a slightly different question to both rick and concepcion rick um i would love to know what is your favorite aspect of visiting sevilla and concepcion i would love to know from you what is your favorite part of living in sevilla why have you decided to make that city your home I'll let Concepcion goes first, and then I will enter and we'll say goodbye to everybody. 
Well, I had no choice because I was born here, so I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it. It was just uh, determined by my birth. And uh, the truth is that um, in most of Spain, you don't really question that much uh, about moving. And uh, when you live in a city like this one, um, which has all advantages, has a perfect size, has a perfect air, has a perfect location, has a perfect river, has a perfect people, has a perfect food. Uh, you don't even question moving. Your family's here. Um, it's, it's, it's where you want to be. So to uh, me, just, just, just breathing, just the color, just the light, just uh, makes you feel so alive. I don't know. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that that you are anchored there. There's no question of where else you would live. I mean, it's great to be able to move around and be mobile and free as the wind, but it's also great to have roots that way. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out right now and I can see it's after dark, but I can see the lights of my old um, junior high school. I mean, I'm, I'm living right where I, I went to school as a schoolboy, and uh, I just feel right here. And, you know, one thing great about traveling is you appreciate the beauties of your own home, wherever it may be. Uh, and uh, boy, I can imagine when you live in Sevilla, you're thankful to be born there and have family there and roots there. As far as a tourist, what I appreciate about Sevilla, I mentioned that word earlier, duenda. What is that word that I'm trying to say, duenda? Duende. Duende. It's the word for soul. And when you look, when you feel the energy, the passion, the love, the soul of a gypsy musician singing, you can, you can hear the wailing of the Arabic heritage and the Jewish heritage and the con Reconquista and the centuries of hard times and, and, and all of the love today. When I hear that, I feel there's that soul. And you got that duende more in Andalusia, more in the cities of Andalusia than, than anywhere else. And um, it shows itself in the festivals, in the processions, in the love of Hamon, in, 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 in just the embrace of life. And as we get pushed along in this materialistic, fast paced, hard hitting, very affluent world, it's more and more precious to have these little enclaves of quality living. And there are quality, there are dimensions of good living in Andalusia that can inspire us all. And if you have a friend like Concepcion, it's easier to connect. But anybody who travels thoughtfully in Andalusia becomes a better person for it. I will just say that much. Concepcion, thank you so much for staying awake all night long for us. You are, <laughs> yeah, I, I was reluctant to ask you to do this because we all want our, our beautiful night's sleep, but you've shared so much and I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for 20 years of you helping guide our groups, making our TV shows good when we're in Andalusia and, and making our, our, our guidebook correct. So you need to go to bed now and uh, <laughs> have a good half a night's sleep. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Gabe. And I wanna remind you, if you're not making mistakes, you're not having enough fun, don't try to be perfect. And let me just illustrate that with a few bloopers, okay? Cause right now we're gonna go back for our just one minute of bloopers and we're gonna celebrate the joy of screwing up in Europe. Happy travels. But I enjoy the multifaceted heart and soul of this multifaceted region with a multifaceted visit to the interior first. <laughs> These cliffs and those cliffs in Africa created what ancients living in the Mediterranean world considered the gates of Hercules, the pillars of Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> you got apple. You got my, he's got my apple. He's going to take your apple. Okay, you want my apple? He's taking my apple. Okay, right now I'm thinking my passport is in the outside pocket of my day bag. The day bags, by the way, are on sale. I just was told by my staff, I think they're 30% off. Is that right, Gabe? 30% off for the day bags. I love my day bags. But right now I love my passport even more. I know I should have had it in my money belt, but I don't. This uh, monkey is grabbing, this little ape is grabbing my bag because he wants the apple. I'm just thinking you can have the stupid apple, but I want my passport. And I'm hanging on and I'm thinking, does he have rabies? What am I going to do? No, you okay, take you know, it. Don't there's worry. A, there's a toggle switch that you can... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you can have it. You can. You can. You can. Let him take it. He'll. He'll. No. Okay.
My dream was to get one of these stupid Gibraltar apes to hold the British flag and fly it because they're so proud to be in the British enclave of Gibraltar. Here on the Rock of Gibraltar, the locals are very friendly, but give them your apples. He opened, she okay. opened, he opened. I want opened, you to hang on to this. Bag. Here you go. Here. Here. Oh, don't poke him with it. No, He'll go. kill Take you. Take that. Don't forget to enjoy the journey. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling in Buen Camino. <laughs> Buenas noches, Concepcion. Buenas noches, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, Concepcion. Good night, Julianne. Thank you for joining us, everybody.